Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, a King Killer Chronicle reread podcast. We are your hosts, Will and Phoenix. Let's get into it. Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, episode 18. Don't mess with the bull, young man, you'll get the horns where we will be looking at chapters 39 and 40 of The Name of the Wind through the lens of questioning authority. So every week on this podcast, we examine a section of the book, The Name of the Wind, through a chosen lens and figure out what we can take from the text and apply to our real lives. We'll also take time at the end to explore models of practical wisdom with an Aristotelian phronemos of the week. And after that, we will expand our understanding of our own world, with interesting facts. Before we leave you, we will wrap things up with seven words from the book and seven words from our own lives. As a little side note, as this is episode 18 and we have not yet asked, we would like to remind you that rating us on the podcast app you listen to us with or leaving a review both feeds our ego and helps other people find our podcast. We would love it if you would like, share, and subscribe. I know that you've all heard that before, but it really does matter. One other thing for our fans to note, I would like to know what your favorite outtake is from the end of our show. So if you would like to let us know, you can go ahead and send us a tweet about it at WaystonePod on Twitter. And before we begin, let's get some disclaimers out of the way. First of all, we are, as always, in no way affiliated with Patrick Rothfuss or his publisher, Daw Books. Second of all, our discussions are naturally going to assume that either A, you've already read the main books, The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear, as well as the other ancillary novellas and short stories in the continuity, or B, you're someone who likes to know the future like some sort of weird prognosticator of future events. Also, a word to our community, while it's perfectly fine to critique the text, we do it plenty here, we're not going to stand for any kind of abuse of the author or any other person. In short, let's be nice to one another, because that's what we need this time. With that out of the way, now it's time for me to give us a 45 second recap of this week's events. You're going to go with 45 seconds again? Yeah. I've learned from my hubris, and I don't want any more cherry ripe. I wouldn't make you have cherry ripe. We'd find something else. Doesn't mean I want it. All right, Bear. I've got a timer ready. Are you ready? Hang on a sec. Let me warm up a little bit. Yes, I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> In three... Two, one, go. On the second day of class, Hem challenges Kvoth's mastery, hoping to prove the Latin ass and satisfy Hem's need for flattery. Kvoth gives a demonstration of the principles of sympathy, thinking at Hem's defenestration it only shows a lack of empathy. Hem has Kvoth brought up on the horns for an act of malfeasance, leaving the young prodigy forlorn at the prospect of leaving at once. Instead, Kvoth can thank his luck for entrance to the Arcanum with only three lashes struck, a fate truly random. 28.02 seconds. No cherries for me. You made it in under 30 seconds. You didn't have to relax your challenges. I have learned my lesson of hubris. You learned from episode 12. I did. <laughs> Although I do have to admit, I really like your use of defenestration in that. Well, you know, it's a fun word to say. All right. So now that we have successfully recapped. Congratulations. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about our lens, which this week is questioning authority. So questioning authority is something that we're oftentimes told is a good thing to do. And it's true it is, but it's not without consequences, because when you question authority, authority has a tendency to question back. Or just squash. And so with the questioning of authority, you have to be prepared to accept the consequences for that, which is what we'll see happening this week. So I note that the first of our two chapters that we're looking at has a lot of quoth. How should I put this? Assuming 
Hem's mental state and motivations. He does, again, sort of paint him as this villain from the start. Given that we know Quoth knows how stories work and knows how to make people hate someone, I don't know that we can trust that to be an accurate description of Hem as an actual person, as a historical character. Right. But what I actually meant was there's a lot of Quoth assigning a motivation to facial expressions or to the way that Hem behaved in the class. If it were me and someone said, we'll talk before class, I'd have probably assumed that they meant outside of the classroom and not in the classroom full of at least 50 people. So I would have waited outside the door and maybe Hem was looking for Quoth outside the door. Who knows? I don't know that he intended the night before to simply embarrass Quoth the next day. That's giving a weird motivation to a teacher. So if I'm putting myself into Hem's position, let's assume that I am a rational teacher. I've seen hundreds, if not thousands, of students coming through my class, many of them thinking that they are hot. Shirt. It's not unreasonable to expect a certain degree of proof of that intelligence. Though generally you would expect that the teacher would talk to the student about doing that instead of putting him on the spot. And again, in Quoth's retelling, he obviously doesn't, but that says nothing about what actually happened. Because remember, Quoth is an unreliable narrator. He's never been one to let the truth get in the way of a good story. To quote Gaelic Storm. <laughs> so everything he says has to be put through that reminder. He's not reliable. He's not someone who tells the truth naturally. And in fact, he seems to enjoy lying about things for attention. And this is also something that Patrick Rothfuss himself has said. I know that at one point there was a tattoo that someone had gotten that was based off of the name of the land or the Kingkiller Chronicle. And apparently the words were supposed to have said something. I don't remember what. But Patrick Rothfuss was looking at that and going, you better hope that that's what it actually means because um, it might not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like kids getting kanji tattoos when they don't know how to read it. So Hem has Quoth go up onto the stage to give the lecture himself. You know, this is, of course, unexpected, but Quoth, ever the performer, kind of has a bit of a, a ball with this. He makes a meal of it. I don't know if he does a decent job of teaching this because I think all of what he teaches is probably end of term type things. It seems a lot like giving a preview of things to come as opposed to actually really demonstrating something. It's kind of like watching a Bill Nye the Science Guy demonstration and then that's your whole class. I don't know how effective that is at actually deeply learning, but it at least gives you some context. And I don't think Quoth is really that good of a teacher because he seems more caught up in the applause and the show than whether people actually learned anything. And a lot of what he's doing is only possible because of the training that he had with Abenthi, which we're kind of given to understand is not normal for kids his age to have had. So I don't know that we need to go through every little step about what he did in his demonstration. I don't think it adds a whole lot of value, though there's a lot of those assigning motivation bits that I just want to point out. Quoth assumes that not only is him looking for him at the beginning of class, that his choice to have Quoth give a lecture was a way to mock him. And that Hem had started this little game and now couldn't back out without looking foolish. That's assuming that Hem did not intend for things to actually progress. Yeah, because as we see, if it is in fact a trap, Hem managed to perhaps do far worse than make Quoth feel foolish. He ended up potentially getting Quoth kicked out of the university and really... The only reason that didn't work out is, as we shall see, beneficence on the part of certain masters. And second, he ended up getting Quoth whipped, which is some pretty harsh 
cruel punishment. You consider that that was considered valid corporal punishment for things like desertion in the military, things that are meant to be given to hardened soldiers as a punishment, and they're meeting this out to a kid. A student. Exactly. Also, his desire to see me embarrassed, an exaggerated graciousness and genuine amusement, certain that the more grandiose my preparations were, the greater my embarrassment would be. If I look at it from Hem's perspective, there's also a perfectly benevolent explanation, which is to say, one, he could have been thinking, if the kid knows what he says he does, perhaps this will be a good demonstration for the students. Two, if he can't do what he says he can, well, he will have been brought down to size. And it's Quoth's insistence on making it personal that kind of ruins any of that. He also very clearly, in his retelling, states, with your permission, Master. And that will end up being what gets him out of the worst of the trap. So once again, there are words like magnanimous, confident in his safety, feigning astonishment. All of these motivations that I think you can read incorrectly from somebody's face if you have a predisposition to disliking or a predisposition to think you know what the motivations of a person are. And Quoth has pretty clearly made up his mind about what he thinks Hem is actually like. Knowing him for all of 20 minutes. Granted, if everything that is stated about how Hem behaved is true, first of all, he should not be a teacher. Second of all, a sexist comment like the one he made in our last episode... I would have gone to the program director or to the head of the school or what have you. I mean, granted, Hem is probably the program director for rhetoric, but I would have gone to the chancellor or I would have gone and asked about who to talk to about an abusive teacher or a sexist teacher. And that's not just idle speculation because I have done that kind of thing. I kind of feel like if Quoth really cared about the harm done to Rhea in the last episode, he should have talked to her to see how she felt about it to make sure that if he were to go forward and report this, that was something that she actually wanted. Because as much as it may feel like it's okay to just white knight for someone, to do so without their consent is taking away their agency. It's kind of ooky. It really is. That's the other part about questioning authority is knowing how to do so and when it's worth it. How to do so in a constructive manner as well. Really, in this case, what Quoth is actually objecting to isn't any deficiency on Hem's part. It isn't his treatment of other students. It's just that he isn't going as fast as Quoth would like. And that's not actually a battle worth fighting. So I've run afoul of teachers before, and in retrospect, I'm not proud of how I behaved. When I was a junior in college, I was taking the philosophy for non-majors. And as an upper division philosophy student, I felt the whole thing was kind of beneath me. So I oftentimes would sit in the back of the lecture hall and crack jokes with my friends about the subject matter at hand, yes, but it was still disrespectful because even if the jokes are on point, it's still distracting other students. At the end of the day, it really wasn't about me. And one of the professors who taught that class happened to overhear some of my jokes. And this was a professor that I knew pretty well and respected and admired. And he became extremely angry with me over this. And I don't blame him, because I was disrespectful. Yeah, I was paying for the class, but at the same time, so was everybody else in that auditorium. And my own amusement or boredom didn't overwrite their right to actually get something out of the class. We underestimate, I think, how much effect we can have on people. And I remember him yelling at me in front of everybody he got so angry. And I felt terrible about it. 
I wasn't speaking truth to power. I wasn't questioning authority. I was just being a jerk. Eventually, one of my friends actually went to him during his office hours and told him explicitly that I had been also helping her learn the material and that my jokes and such had actually helped her make sense of a lot of the stuff that she was learning about. And me and the professor apologized to one another. But I can see where Hem's coming from here. He's got a student who's kind of a jerk about things and is trying to make the class all about him. I don't think I was ever truly that bad on staying in a classroom and just either muttering or making jokes that disrupted the class, especially not at DigiPen. Though I was at community college with one of my very, very close friends, and quite often we would go and get tacos instead of going to our pre-press class. Somehow we both passed it, I don't understand. Anyway, <laughs> I think my way of handling these kind of situations is more of the avoidance. If I can get out of it, I will attempt to get out of it. No. Both tried to get out of it. And I think what we actually see in this chapter is Kvothe's resentment being masked under, but I was the one who was right the whole time. And as we should see here, while he may have a grasp of the mechanics, he knows all about the coulda. He has no clue about the shoulda. The fact that he just kind of walks out the room and doesn't expect any consequences. Oh boy. Well, and then we get a little bit of the things that I think makes Quoth a little more relatable as the next chapter is spent with him basically getting anxious about things as he starts to hear what people are talking about. He starts hearing the word malfeasance a lot. And I think this is something that Quoth would probably have learned about had he been willing to actually sit and listen in Hem's class. Once again, though, I think that we see how obvious it is that Quoth didn't know as much as he thought he knew about the university. I think this is a way to illustrate why it's important to read the manual or to read the welcome pamphlet or what have you. And if the university does not have such things, I'm sure they have official rules written somewhere that students can actually read should they want to read the terms and conditions. Yeah, in fact, Lauren probably knows where they are. Lauren probably can recite them. Yeah, the student handbook is there for a reason. It's there to outline the students' rights and responsibilities and the code of conduct that they have agreed to live by while they're at the university. There has to be some kind of documentation of this. And Quoth hasn't really shown any curiosity about that. It occurred to me, the first day of class is never terribly informative on the subject matter. It is usually extremely and painfully informative on things from the syllabus. There are a lot of points of order about class structure and office hours and reading assignments. And yeah, that's to be expected. But again, Kvothe has no idea what to expect. He's never had any formal education at all. So let's go on to the next chapter for real this time. This is where Quoth stops being quite so self-congratulatory. Instead of being a victory lap, with him walking out to cheers and hurrahs as he shakes his hands in adulation. Or more accurately, a couple people waved at him and gave him a thumbs up. Thumbs up exists in this society? That is a little weird, isn't it? Just a little. <laughs> yeah, he's having dinner and... This is where Simon first tells him about malfeasance. And Manette says, probably the wisest words that Quoth will never listen to. You've got to pick your battles, boy. Seven words, in fact. And all Quoth can say to this is, he started it. I know, I love that so much. It's just like, but he started it. And I kind of have to say, did he though? I mean, he gave Quoth the opportunity to show his knowledge and Quoth instead made it personal. He could have made a demonstration that didn't involve harming the professor in any way. Nothing forced him to do that. Except that was the first thing he thought to do, which does speak a little bit to the fact that he just came from a living situation 
where he was living on the streets and having to be the aggressor. Yeah, he came from a very predatory environment. Showing strength was the only thing that mattered. So I think he's trying to do that with his wit. And picking the wrong battles. He even says, I had made an enemy of one of the Nine Masters. How thick can you get? Right. This was all completely avoidable. <laughs> we get a reminder that Kvothe is brand new off the streets. In that even when he has his stomach turning in knots, he would rather take his time and eat than go to this meeting that he has been summoned to. The fact that he says, yeah, it'll wait, let me eat first. On the one hand, I respect his gratitude for the meal. On the other, that's not something one does lightly. He made all nine of the masters wait for him. He's like, I know that these people who are important to the university and have my future in their hands are waiting for me to finish eating. That definitely takes some arrogance. To paraphrase Savoy. And then he goes into the meeting chamber where he sees the masters seated around the crescent-shaped table, which gives the whole on the horns phrase its meaning, which may also be a reference to the Breakfast Club. <laughs> the title of our episode definitely is. So the initial charges that Quoth is brought up on are as a student not of the Arcanum, performing sympathetic bindings with malicious intent. That is, unauthorized use of sympathy and malfeasance. Now, those are pretty serious charges. And there's clearly a record of this happening. The events themselves weren't necessarily a lie. We have a painstaking account of the fact that Jameson was recording this whole meeting. So there is proof somewhere that this existed. For the first grievance, the unauthorized use of sympathy, Quoth could be liable for between two and ten lashes on the back. That's pretty harsh. While we know that Quoth is an unreliable narrator, there are bits and pieces of proof that things did happen that he will talk about. In this case, when we see him in the inn, after he takes his shirt off, he has old scars straight and clean across his back. That seems to be from the whipping. It certainly fits. And then the second charge, malfeasance, is the worrisome one, which carries anywhere from 4 to 15 lashes and expulsion from the university. And it doesn't seem like there's any choice in this matter. It seems like it is automatic. You're gone. Which seems a little rash to me because if somebody has done malfeasance in the university and then they are expelled without any formal training or any explanation as to really why you don't do this thing, there's nothing keeping him in check. I'm also going to point out that if Kvothe had waited through the class and actually tried to learn from it, maybe he would have been aware of it. Because remember, the course is structured assuming that students can't do sympathy and would then be instructed both in its use and also what malfeasance would be as part of that course. So both is kind of an edge case there. I just think that the system doesn't have a lot of safety nets for edge cases. I don't think their society in general does either. So ultimately, while Hem could have asked for the full amount of lashes, he did not. I mean, he goes a little high, but he doesn't go to the full extent. He asks for five lashes and then eight. Now that is a lot. That is a really, really, really severe punishment. And one would assume that because there is a record that this is all accurate and not exaggerated, but it sounds a little exaggerated. Even if him is the biggest fork face that you have ever seen in the entire university ever. It seems like that's just a little extreme. And I want to give him the benefit of the doubt because much like having watched Gilmore Girls when I was 16 and identifying very strongly with Rory at the time, 
And having then gone back at 30 something to watch it with you, and we both just identified with Lorelai the whole time, I am less likely to give Quoth the benefit of the doubt in these situations where he is dealing with an authority figure and can't figure out how to have actual diplomacy because, again, he's 15 and he's about as subtle as a gold brick to the face. Well, and it's not just that. I don't think he's good at actually establishing what his ultimate objectives are. Like, he doesn't seem to know what he's applying himself towards. He's just going forward with this vague goal. He doesn't really know what any of his goals mean. And so his ability to actually work towards those objectives are similarly muddled. No matter how smart he may be, if he doesn't know what he's working for, he can't actually focus his efforts towards anything. And when he finally gets a chance to defend himself, he can only really come back to a technicality, namely that he had permission. Let's rewind a little bit. When asked initially if he has a defense, he freezes. Much like I think all of us probably would, especially since he was put on the spot. He wasn't given any time to prepare for this, except he kind of took time to eat, thus proving his arrogance. But he remembers something that Ben said. You have to defend yourself. And I think that that's true, I just think that he does it badly. I think that the best defense in this case would have been to find another master, another authority figure to him, but a peer of Hem's. Have a conversation about, hey, is this normal? Because even asking an upperclassman really isn't going to get you the official rules unless you ask someone that is just known for being able to point you in the right direction. But even then, I used to be asked a lot of questions, and I don't know if that's because I was able to find and or ask for clarification a lot, and therefore I had that information, and the other students would just ask me, or if it was because I was older than them, and they thought that I was kind of a medium step of authority between themselves and the teachers, and I wasn't as scary as the teachers. But I don't get the impression that Quoth is scared to talk to the adults. I just think he doesn't think about it. It never occurs to him that the professors are just as beholden to the school's laws as anyone else. Or that the other professors might have his back. Yeah, and we know that there are professors who seem to have some degree of sympathy towards him, particularly Elodin and Kilvin. I would say Elk Sadal and Kilvin. Because Elodin's an agent of chaos. I don't think that Elodin has Kvothe's interest at heart. I think that he wants to kind of stir the pot and see what happens. There's a reason why he's only regarded as half a seat. <laughs> is he the one that's half a seat or is the Chancellor half a seat? No, he's the one that's half a seat. How do we know that that's true? In my head canon, Elodin is the half vote. In my head canon, it's either Elodin or the Chancellor himself because... The Chancellor can't be the deciding factor. That would probably be the more organizationally fair one. Like he's not supposed to be the tiebreaker. That could be. But like he tries to say there is a technicality. He had permission. But it's not really a technicality. It's the truth if he's stating things accurately. But it's still a technicality. I don't think that he asked for permission knowing that he would need it as a defense. No, I don't think that he would have had that foreknowledge. But ultimately, Quoth's not wrong. He was given a hair from Hem's head by Hem himself. And if Hem believed in any way that Quoth would be able to use sympathy, I don't think he would have let the demonstration get that far. So I do think there might have been some hubris on Hem's part, thinking that, hey, I'll see what happens. I'll let this go a little bit longer. And as we've discussed, that wouldn't be an unreasonable assumption on Hem's part. Right, just to see how far it goes. Now, if we do take Quoth's word for it, the whole exchange being told accurately, in other words, I think that asking for permission would have been a happy accident. 
at the same time, if there had been any other thing that he could have done, do you think he actually would have done it for his demonstration? Probably not, because I think his motivation in this particular case was to try and make a fool out of him instead of just giving a good demonstration. There are any number of other things that he could have used that wouldn't have involved him in any way hurting the professor. The fact that he is willing to just lie in his defense of himself, it doesn't speak well of Quoth, for one thing. Stating that that was the first demonstration his first teacher ever gave him, and having the limited reagents being a test of what can you do with these things, I think that's, again, showing his arrogance. He could have gotten caught in that lie, but it seemed like it was close enough to the truth that it didn't get him in trouble. I think it does Abanthe a real disservice because it makes Abanthe sound cruel. Like the first demonstration he gave Quoth was something that caused blisters up to his knee. I think that there is a very distinct possibility that Quoth the storyteller is embellishing what Hem complained about. That's entirely possible. I think that we're supposed to think that Hem is exaggerating. Even then, he would have had to have gone to the physiker for something like that. There would be a record of it. So many technicalities that we can go rabbit holing down. But I had the same thought. I think the rest of the exchange is telling. I am inclined to believe Quoth a little bit. I don't want to make it seem like I don't believe our protagonist at all. I think it was a little bit of creative thinking on Hem's part to ask Foth to give a demonstration and that it would be unusual, especially on the second day of class with a brand new student. I think that the reactions of the other masters tells that Hem has not gained a whole lot of friends amongst the other masters. He doesn't strike me as the sort of person who makes friends easily. Or well. Though Brandor seems to be his ally, at least. There's a big difference between a friend and an ally. So we go along, and at the end of Quoth's performance, he states that his father would be proud. And I'm going to put this out here. I don't think that Arladen would have been proud of Quoth's use of his stage training in order to lie his way through mitigating a punishment. Well, and as we see here, there's also some of that arrogance again, where he then tries to use this as a way to get himself into the Arcanum. It works, though. It's truly audacious to do so. <laughs> It'd be like if I'm at work and I'm hauled in for a reprimand, and then I say, and by the way, I'd like a promotion. I think that... The reason he got away with it is, once again, shock factor. If you come up with something clever and you were the first one to do it, I think that that can take you a long way towards getting what you want. It's not something that could be replicated a second time, usually, though. And he's gotten away with this kind of crap twice. Also, the next student who thinks to do something like this will definitely not get the benefit. Yeah. Should I tell the Carl story? Tell the Carl story. <laughs> so I worked with a guy at a grocery store, and for his senior year of high school, he decided to do running start instead at the local community college. And he decided that instead of paying for a second year of community college after finishing high school, he would rather have the school district pay for another year of running start. So he discovered as a loophole that if he did not receive his diploma, he would not have officially graduated and therefore he could continue on as a running start student instead of having to pay for that extra year by himself. So he simply just refused to go pick up his diploma from the school and then he had it returned in the mail. So yeah, he never officially graduated from high school, allowing him to complete running start on the school district's dime. As if that wasn't enough. The next year, as he started looking at what it would take to get into a four-year program in computer science, he discovered that his grades weren't quite at the level that he wanted. And he knew that there were several classes that he had really sandbagged on and just 
did the bare minimum to get by. And so what he did is he realized that what he would need to do would be to fail a class so that he would not have enough credits to graduate. So he then went to a professor in a class that he was doing okay in. He was just getting a B in. And he took one of his papers in and he convinced the professor that this was an F-worthy paper. That, in fact, his work in this class deserved an F. That he deserved to completely fail this and flunk it. So then he would no longer qualify for graduation and would then be able to take another term where he took every class that he got less than an A in and then proceeded to ace all of those, <laughs> graduating with a perfect 4.0 GPA. All of these seem like implausible things because the registrar should have known he already took some of these classes unless he failed them and he had to retake them. So, because I don't think that you can retake something unless you get a very bad grade in them. Secondly, the school district for his high school has some really stupid rules if all it takes is just saying, nope, I don't want this piece of paper. And that somehow makes it so he didn't graduate even though he should have been registered as having graduated and passed all of his high school. And that they didn't look to see any of this information when they just okayed another year of running start. All of this is just one right after another after another of circumstances that if anyone had been competent at their job, <laughs> this wouldn't have worked out. I don't think anyone could get away with doing this again. I don't think anyone should have gotten away with this at the first place. Probably not, but I have to say, Credit for being willing to actually go through all the effort to find those loopholes. It's amazing how clever people can still have situations where it's very obvious that they have been really, really super dumb. And to his credit, he did have to actually do the work to ace all of those classes. Yeah. And the policy at the time was you could take any class as often as you liked, and it would just take whatever the highest one was for your GPA. Wow. Now, when he then applied to the School of Computer Science, they looked at that kind of uh, lateral thinking on his part and saw, hey, this kid would probably be pretty good at programming. Fair enough. There is a sentence that keeps kind of sticking up every time that I hear this book or read this book that comes from Hem. After Arwell points out that if Hem actually gave Quoth his hair that this wasn't malfeasance and it had, at the very least, implied permission. Hem says, I expected him to have more control over what he was doing. So that kind of gives lie to Hem's motivations. He either thinks that Kvothe is not going to be able to do any of this, or that Kvothe is an expert, or thinks them both at the same time, which are incongruent thoughts. Which, if you think about it, is exactly what sympathy requires. Right. Kvothe manages to talk himself down to reckless use of sympathy, which still carries punishment for it. And he's still going to be whipped three times. Which is three more than any child should ever be subject to. I'd say kid rather than child. Child seems like it's rather patronizing in this case. Adolescent, teenager, all those words are a little less condescending. But let me put it this way. If I discovered that someone at the local high school was whipped by the faculty, even once, I would be furious at that. You'd call the police. Yeah, that is abuse and endangerment of the student. It's definitely something we wouldn't take lightly in our society. So when the masters are voting on whether or not the punishment should be suspended, Morin does not raise his hand. Kvothe thinks that if he hadn't started off with such a bad impression for Lauren, that maybe Lauren would have tipped the scales in his favor. I think that shows a very bad misjudgment of Lauren's character. We agree. I think Lauren is lawful neutral. That means that the rules are the rules no matter what. And whether he liked Kvothe or not, he would have kept with that judgment. And I think that in some ways, Elodin is lawful, I don't know... He's chaotic lawful. 
Is that a way that you can be? No, but <laughs> in the way that he's a creature of contradictions, yes. He is a chaos Muppet. I think that he values rules and structure, even as he appears to balk at them. I can get that. One thing I do know about mental illness being someone who has generalized anxiety disorder. Having a list of what you're going to do each day, having a schedule, having a structure, having rules, even if they're one set by yourself, helps. Yeah, I could see him needing that. Also, the sense that he probably ran afoul of some of these regulations himself in the past and wouldn't want someone else getting away with something that he didn't. <laughs> I think there's a bit of that. Speaking of Elodin also, I had forgotten how Elodin's light voice moved through the deep places in your chest when he spoke. He only met Elodin the once at his admissions interview. That's an interesting description of Elodin speaking. Kind of like air. Kind of like wind. So then Elodin is one of the people who actually speaks up in Quoth's favor of admission into the Arcanum. While he didn't oppose punishing Quoth, he also certainly was in favor of promoting Quoth. Because he says, I can think of students currently enrolled in the Arcanum who would be hard-pressed to complete a double binding, let alone draw enough heat to blister a man's foot to the knee. I like how that's in quotes. Blister a man's foot to the knee. <laughs> he also has a healthy disdain of him. As we've alluded to before, casual arson. Indeed. And then Elk Sadal, who of course always looks like an evil Grand Vizier, but who's totally friendly, speaks up in favor as well. And Kilvin, ever the pragmatist, is just curious, but I want to know the mechanics of this. Let's talk about this. <laughs> It ultimately passes that they agree to give Quoth three lashes and admission to the Arcanum. At the end of the meeting, I note that Hem and Brandor go off into an exterior chamber. And while the door is open, there's talk of, weren't you wearing a gram? And then you might as well blame someone stabbed in an alley for not wearing armor. Which I think is an interesting point and one that can be added to anyone who was assaulted, any way that they are assaulted should not be blamed because of the way they look, act, or are dressed. But I digress. The statement, we should all take precautions, you know as well as, and then the door shut. It's a little mystery in all of three lines of the book. It's a little nibble. I don't think we get any more. I think it's a thread that will have been dropped by the time we get further. Or it's one of those callbacks that's going to be like, oh. We'll find out. One by one, the teachers either talk to Kvothe or leave. And we get a sense that Kilvin has taken a shine to Kvothe. He wants to do away with the basic artifice in class. And he seems to have forgotten that Quoth is going to be whipped tomorrow at noon, tries to make an appointment with him <laughs> to come in and discuss doing things that are a little more advanced. Though I'd like to point out that being good at one subject does not mean that you are that good at another subject. And we don't actually know Quoth's practical knowledge of artificing, and neither does Kilvin. I'm also amused where Arwell reminds Kilvin that Wait, he's being whipped tomorrow at noon. Okay, so have him come by at one. <laughs> Kilvin is just so interested in this new student that's such an upstart. He's really curious to pick this kid's brain, and it's kind of enchanting that he forgets about what all of the punishment actually entails. Arwell very calmly states that they'll stitch Kvothe back together after the whipping, and it makes me wonder how often they whip people at the university. Greater than zero is still too many. Eventually, the room empties out except for the Chancellor. Kvothe says, I'm sorry to be so much trouble so soon. To which the Chancellor asks, how long had you intended to wait? At least a span, sir. I think that's kind of clever. Instead of assuming that Kvothe had misspoken and that he had no intention of being a pain in the ash. I think the Master Linguist has a taste for banter. And wordplay. 
We once again get a reminder that Kvothe is not as young as he looks. At least Kvothe's interpretation of how other people think of him is that he is not as young as he looks. I think he's just as young as he looks. I think that maybe he has a clever streak and maybe he has some knowledge that he was privileged enough to receive from a skilled teacher when he was young. But I don't think he's more mature than his age would say. I don't think that being intelligent is the same as being wise. And on the flip side of that, he mentions that he realizes the Chancellor probably isn't as old as he looks, being just on the other side of 40. Hey, we're getting close to that age. I know, right? <laughs> but it's just sort of an interesting bit of symmetry there. I will give Patrick Rothfuss this. He has an excellent way with words and an excellent way with crafting a narrative and details like that. When Quoth leaves the meeting, Sim startles him and he responds essentially like a feral Tasmanian devil, which is kind of a reminder that he's only been off the streets of Tarbian for probably less than a week. Those instincts don't just go away. As someone who is hypervigilant and who got that way because of constant negative stimuli, it is incredibly hard to not interpret everything through the lens that you were interpreting things through when they were bad. Kvothe probably has a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of adrenaline response to almost every stimuli. There was a time at which I constantly asked you if you were mad at me if you weren't talking with me. Like, just not talking. Not that you were pointedly not talking to me, just you were being quiet. Your mouth wasn't flapping. And I was never sure what was going on in your head. It turns out what was going on in your head... Sometimes pigs are much bigger than you might expect. <laughs> ...was generally nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but the part of my brain that had to be on high alert all the time had a really hard time shutting off. And I believe that that's true about Kvothe. It's one of his factors that actually makes him, I think, more relatable. It's very difficult to relate to someone as this hyper-intelligent, super genius who knows everything, but it's a lot easier to relate to someone who's dealt with a lot of trauma in their life and is dealing with the fallout from that. I also think it might explain his instant assumptions about him. I think that's probably true. He was reading darker than is actually there. I think in a lot of ways, Kvothe has a very black and white version of the world coming into his senses. That makes sense. It would fit with the story he's lived. So then Kvothe has to move into the Arcanum bunks, which are closer to the bathing facilities. Apparently. And while his former bunkmates seem very happy for his success, his new bunkmates are a little bit more muted. Well, there's a different response here. Presumably, anyone that he is interacting with in his original bunk either just went through or is currently in Hem's class. And if everyone has a poor association with Hem or a poor opinion of Hem, well, I can see why they'd be very congratulatory and, oh my gosh, how did you get through something that terrifying? I could never be like you, but I admire the hell out of you. And then he gets to a spot where other people had to earn their place. And they're all looking at him like, no, go away. Yes, yes, you're very smart. Shut up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Peter Falk. Yeah, I have that reaction a lot to Quoth. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that is one of the more memorable passages of the book. We're supposed to be impressed by Quoth. And the more that I read that, on repeat viewing, the less I'm impressed with Kvothe. It starts to get kind of smug and smarmy. But now, it is time for us to get to our Fernemos. I believe it is your turn for that. I believe you are correct, sir. So who's your Fernemos? So that was a little hard for me, because we don't get a lot of any one character other than Kvothe. 
and it's not Quoth because it's never Quoth. We don't get a lot of Sim, though of Quoth's friends, he's the one we see the most. We get a lot of Hem. And as much as I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt, I also think that he is a jerk. I also think that he doesn't bring a lot of actual value into the story in terms of anything other than an antagonistic paper villain. So he's not it. That pretty much just leaves the other masters. And I was kind of stuck between three. And those three are the Chancellor, Elxadal, and Elodin. And I'm still kind of stuck between them. I like the Chancellor because he recognizes that this is a foolish thing to do, but he's kind of going along with it because he wants to see what happens. He kind of reminds me of Timothy Oliphant in the anti-penultimate episode of The Good Place, where he responds, wait, wait, I want to see where this goes. <laughs> <laughs> Not to spoil too much. And then I like Elk Sadal because he's the one who pretty much points out that Hem is going about things a rather strange and non-productive way. But I think I wanted to choose Elk Sadal more because I like him as a character and in the future I know more about him. And then Elodin. I think I'm choosing Elodin because he can see right and wrong. He can see through Kvothe's bullshit. But he very clearly likes Kvothe. I also think he wants to see how things progress. But I think he's got more mischievous intent. He waves at Kvothe. He tries to either psych Kvothe out. We don't know what his motivations really are. Or be friendly to Quoth. Quoth takes it as a friendly gesture. Not really sure he should have. It's like, hi, toodles. <laughs> and while we are led to believe that Elodin is a bit mad, I think he just sees things differently. He's not enamored with Quoth's BS, but he is enamored with the possibilities and what could be. One of the things I noticed about Elodin is while he admires Kvothe's potential, he also recognizes the difference between where Kvothe is and where he could be. Whereas Kvothe, I think, seems to always want to skip to the end. I think Kvothe wars between wanting to skip to the end and thinking he's already there. Yeah. But Elodin also gives an example of why Kvothe doesn't need to go through the prereqs. Although, once again, I'm going to point out, being good at one subject does not mean that you are good at all subjects. Maybe test his abilities first. Also, maybe test his ability to judge when it's appropriate to apply said abilities. I don't know that that's in the master's purview. <laughs> yeah, they do a whole bunch of meddling with that which ought not be meddled with. Yes. So I think that's my Fernemos. It's a good one. Thank you. Speaking of Master Elodin, it's time for us to take a page from his book and learn a bit about our world with an interesting fact of the week. It's my turn this week, and I think I've got a pretty fitting one based on everything that we've described. So this is called Évariste Galois, the Radical Mathematician. So Évariste Galois lived between 1811 and 1832 and was famous for a few things. Discovering a proof that could determine whether or not a formula existed for solving an advanced polynomial equation, particularly quintic or higher, and also for his radical anti-monarchist politics in France. I'll give you a hint which one of those he ended up dying for. <laughs> it wasn't the mathematics, though he may have felt it was. He was a mathematical prodigy who was enrolled at an exceptionally young age as a student at the Collège Royal de Louis-le-Grand. There he managed to break new mathematical ground and annoy the headmaster in equal proportions. He set about seeking admission to the prestigious École Polytechnique, which was the foremost technical school of the time. However, his mathematical genius was not matched with a facility for actually communicating his ideas effectively, and the entrance board was ultimately unimpressed. He waffled a lot, in other words. This would be a recurring pattern throughout Galois' tragically short life. 
In addition to multiple failed entrance exams, he was also plagued by circumstance when trying to get his work published with the Academy of Sciences. In addition to poking at those members of the Academy who were loyal monarchists, Galois suffered multiple rounds of bad luck where submissions were lost, or forgotten, or eclipsed by other mathematicians who arrived posthumously and proved the same ideas in a more effective manner, in the case of Niels Henrik Abel. This guy had already proved a lot of the things that Galois was trying to prove, but he had done it nine years earlier and then died. His work was only discovered later, just as Galois' mentor was about to publish his own work. Oh. As to his political and personal life, much of what we know comes from his acquaintance, Alexandre Dumas. Yes, that Dumas, of the Three Musketeers and Count of Monte Cristo fame. Dumas and Galois served together in the Republican National Guard Artillery Unit for approximately three weeks before King Louis-Philippe decided that it probably wasn't a good idea to have a whole bunch of rabid anti-monarchists handling all their cannons. <laughs> At a banquet gathering of former artillerymen, Galois brandished a knife and raised a toast to the king's death, which was a bit much for Dumas, who proceeded to escape by jumping out the window. It was the first floor window, but it was a dramatic exit nonetheless. As a result of this, Galois would find himself in and out of prison for the next year as a result of these sentiments and would drink heavily in his time there. After his release, he would find himself falling in love with the cousin of one of his friends, and said cousin did not feel the same about him, which he would then transfer the bitterness about this onto another mutual friend, believed to be Etienne-Francois Perchot d'Urbanville, who would go on to actually challenge Galois to the duel that would claim the young mathematician's life at the age of 26 on May 20th, 1832. His works would be rediscovered posthumously and recognized for their brilliance, a fate, it must be said, that was only possible because Galois was not alive to sabotage his own success. That's more of a history lesson than it is an interesting fact. Are you interested? <laughs> Were you interested? I was. And in the interest of making this episode not be terribly long, although I'm sure that it is too late, I was interested. And this time, I'll let you get away with an interesting story instead of an interesting fact. This one time. <laughs> this one time. Somehow, there was a very long story about a bear in Poland that is now surfacing its way back up to the top of my memory. <laughs> but this one time. <laughs> All right. And so with that, it is time for our seven words. It is your turn for words from the book. What do you have? I found quite a few including ones that you pointed out, you've got to pick your battles, boy. That just encompasses everything about Kvothe as a character. And I think they're very appropriate. But I think this time around, again, I'm tied between two things. So if I say one of them, you're going to bring up the other one. So the one I am actually choosing is there was a moment of quiet reflection. And while this is not terribly applicable to this section of the book as a whole, right now, recording this at the end of March 2020, with world events being what they are, I think we can all take a moment to reflect quietly, take a deep breath in, as long as you are socially isolated and not in the presence of someone who is sick, and just try to be present if you have the privilege to have that opportunity. I recognize that not everyone can and that this is not a quiet time for every single person just because it's a quiet time for us. There's a lot of worry and there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of unknowns. And as someone who has lived with massive anxiety I find it rather odd that I am not taking this to catastrophizing and that I am not stressing too terribly much. But if you have the opportunity, and I realize that this is coming out a month later than when I've said it, and maybe it's something that you can look back on and take a quiet moment to reflect. So you were also going to tell us the other set of words that 
I was contemplating. Telu shelter us, fools and children all. Words from the Chancellor there, and I thought that was a good expression of Socratic wisdom, in that he's recognizing that everyone is trying to figure out how they're going to move forward with things. As much as we like to think that grown-ups are grown-ups, there's a lot of times when adults are making things up as they go. And it's okay to admit that you don't know the answers to everything. And it's okay to admit that you're foolish. It's the only way to be wise, actually. <laughs> Any kind of wisdom has to start with the understanding of your own limitations. And a certain amount of humility is required. This is something I think that Foth could deal with learning, and it's also something I think Hem could deal with learning. I think we all could deal with learning it. So now that we've gotten the words from the book, what are your words from life? So my words from life are similar to yours in terms of theme, and they are these. Thanks for being my social distancing companion. So right now we are practicing social distancing and living under a stay-at-home order. But you're still working, working from home. But I've got my work that I'm doing with the podcast and editing. For me, there's not been a whole lot of disruption to my normal schedule, to what I normally do on a daily and weekly basis. It's a little frustrating not to have the option to go out without being able to go to a restaurant or to our local guitar store or having face-to-face -face interactions with other people. But I'm pretty good at handling that. And the fact is, I'm just really grateful that I get to spend these social isolation periods with you. I will flat out state that of the people that I have lived with, there is no one, none of them, that I would be as comfortable and feel as loved back than I do with you. Well, it's mutual. I'd like to take this as an opportunity to remind our listeners that we care about you, that we want you to be safe, take care of the people you love, and remember that even if they're driving you up the wall, remind them that you love them. And with that, I'd like to thank you for potting with me. Thank you for potting with me. And thank you for listening to Tales from the Waystone. Join us next week on Tales from the Waystone as we discuss chapters 41 and 42 of The Name of the Wind through the lens of defiance. At this time, I would like to ask once again that you like, share, subscribe, rate, review, all that wonderfulness. Rating us and reviewing us not only feeds our ego, <laughs> but it helps other people find us. And we would like to spread our reach. We would like to thank every single one of you for listening to us, and we'd like to hear from you. You can tweet us at WaystonePod. You can follow the podcast on Instagram at WaystonePod. We have a Facebook page. It's kind of lonely. But if you want to look it up, it is Tales from the Waystone. You can like us on Facebook. We also publish these podcast episodes on YouTube, and there sometimes are very silly videos, including our punishment videos over there. So if you want to subscribe to that, please do so. We would like to extend a huge thank you to Shawnee Jang for our theme music. And of course, a huge thanks to Patrick Rothfuss for creating this world that we've enjoyed exploring together. Audio production and editing, courtesy of me, Phoenix McCullough. Project management and writing, courtesy of me, Will McCullough. If you would like to help support us, please consider becoming a patron on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash waystonepod, where you can get access to our show notes, custom digital posters, exclusive Patreon-only bonus pods, including our backcountry bonus pod that was released on the Vernal Equinox, and our breakdown of The Princess and Mr. Wiffle back on the Winter Solstice. There are also other exciting items. And as always... Here's to one more day above the roses. To one more day above the roses.
Why is my thumb weird? I don't know. Why is your thumb weird? We are oddballs and we know it. I'm giving you plenty of things for your outtakes. Mm-hmm. <laughs>